I suppose we should introduce ourselves. Yes. So good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Julian Gare. I am joined by Ankar Kumar and Roberto Marcico. Is that are you there? Morning. Good, good morning. morning. Good morning, everyone. For this session on all oh, chaps, percutaneous and surgical aortic valve implantation is the session. Yeah, implantation. Oh, there's Roberto. Yeah, welcome, Roberto. So we should be in room two uh, for the audience. Uh, just like to remind everybody, there are ten presentations. Uh, presentations last five minutes, and there are three minutes for questions. Uh, we will try to keep a track on the time and encourage you to provide feedback at the end and put your questions on through the interactive bar, and then we can look to answer them. So without much more to do, apologies from one or two of our co-chairs who can't make it this morning. The first presentation is going to be uh, given by Roberto, in fact, it is the impact of patient prosthesis mismatch in early and long-term survival after aortic valve replacement with the Edwards Perryman by prosthetic valve. The presentation to be given by Roberto on behalf of the group from Bristol. So, welcome. Thank you. Extreme moderator and dearest colleague, thank you very much for the opportunity given to present our data for this meeting. Our study is evaluated the impact of patient prosthesis mismatch on early and long term survival after aortic valve replacement with the Edwards Perimount prosthetic valve. In the last decade, the use of bioprosthetic valve implantation has increased significantly, far exceeding the use of mechanical prosthesis. And the Carpentier Edward Perimount bovine pericardial bioprosthesis. It is widely recognized to be one of the most commonly used bioprosthesis for many years. Uh, as we well know, one of the most common issues after aortic valve replacement, especially after bioprosthesis implantation, is patient prosthesis mismatch. And its main hemodynamic consequences consist on the elevated transvalvular gradient to normal function in prosthetic valve. The impact of patient prosthesis mismatch on short and long term mortality is still subject to debate in literature. And there are many inherent aspects that remain unsolved. For uh, this reason, aim of the uh, this study was to investigate the incidence and the clinical impact of severe patient prosthesis mismatch on early in hospital outcome and long term survival in patients undergoing aortic valve replacement with either sperimount uh, uh, bioprosthetic valve. This has been a single center retrospective analysis conducted at Bristol Royal Infirmary from uh, January 1998 to December 2014, and uh, uh, in where 5,964 consecutive patient adults underwent aortic valve replacement for aortic valve disease, and of those, 2,667 patients received Edward Perimount bioprosthetic valve for both isolated and combined procedures. Considering the effective orifice area less than 0.7. 65 centimeter square over meter square is a cutoff point for severe PPM. Patients were divided in two groups, severe and non-severe PPM, and uh, group A, group B. And uh, to further adjust patient selection and preparative characteristic, a propensity score match analysis was performed, and we defined two groups of 320 patients each. Looking at the preoperative characteristics, as we can see, there are statistically significant differences among the unmatched population in regards of age, Euro score, BMI, uh, blood surface area, gender, diabetes, hypertension, and as well as COPD, peripheral vascular disease, poor left ventricular function, and near class. And also, it appears evident that severe patient prosthesis mismatch occurred more frequently when valve size diameter was less than 23 millimeters. On the other side, a propensity score match population showed similar preoperative characteristics. In the unmatched population, the early outcome showed that the overall perioperative mortality was 3.2%, and there were no difference between uh, the groups except the overall length of stay. It was significantly higher in the groups. 
of severe PPM. In regards to the long-term survival, you can see there was significantly different between the two groups. After the propensity score matching, no difference between the group has been reported in terms of uh, in-hospital mortality, heart function, wound infection, AKI, and length of stay, except for re-exploration for bleeding. However, in this case, the long-term survival was similar between the group not showing any significant difference. The univariate Cox model identified several uh, severe pre-region autism events as independent predictor of increased long-term mortality, similar as age, diabetes, COPD, Euroscore, and poor ventricular function. On the other hand, the multiple crop, the multiple crop regression analysis showed that age, Euroscore, near class, and peripheral vascular disease were independent predictor of long-term mortality. However, the presence of patient to physical mismatch did not impact the long-term mortality. Our study has many limitations and um, the results should be interpreted carefully as we show that patient prosthesis mismatch based on effective or area is not associated to increased adverse outcome. First of all, there was a retrospective single center analysis on pro prospectively collect data in a limited call. And the main effective or area was derived from the previously published normal in vivo values of effective or area index in the patient body surface area and not based on echocardiography. Also, the study included a patient court treated over a long period of time, hence possible compounding factor due to changing clinical practice over time. And the evaluation of long-term outcome after surgery was limited to all cause mortality and no data were available on structural valve deterioration of the need for redo surgery. We can conclude though that presence of patient prosthesis mismatch based on published valve area measurement in patient undergoing aortic valve replacement using either perimount, either perimount bioprosthesis valve does not seem to affect early or late outcome. Thank you. Okay, should be able to hear now. Apologies, I was on mute. So just uh, like to thank you for your presentation. And I'd like to encourage the audience to rate the presentation using the feedback and also to put some questions. The multivariate analysis that you undertook has identified sort of age, NYHA, Euroscore, and presence of peripheral vascular disease as important predictors of long-term survival. Do you think, quite independent of patient prosthesis mismatch, they just represent an older, sicker population? Yes, that could be, actually. Thank you very much for this question. Yes. I think that all these factors contribute significantly in uh, what could be the long-term survival. And uh, this could be either or uh, not related to the presence of patient prosthesis mismatch. Sick so population uh, can be, uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, long-term survival can be affected actually by this contributing factor independently about the patient prosthesis mismatch. Okay. Any other questions from anyone else? I don't see anything uh, from the audience. Does my co-chair Julian? Do you have any questions for? Uh, I just didn't, um, very briefly. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. So, um, good morning and well done. Um, I. As somebody who's never really believed in patient prosthesis mismatch, uh, certainly not in a clinically material way, I guess I'm quite heartened by your um, study. Uh, why do you think you, they bleed? What was I didn't understand the data about excessive bleeding, though. What, what do you think accounts for that? To be honest, I don't have any any explanation that could be related to the you know the valve itself or the surgical uh, procedure. The, the only fact is that we analyze a long uh, court in the long uh, long term of time, 
and this could be the, contributing to this uh, value and the significance because maybe the surgeon or the surgical procedure they change over the time and that could be contributing the long term. And that then of course brings you to the question of whether propensity matching is really a um, a good way of creating a control group in this sort of study. But anyway, as I said, I'm slightly heartened by the fact um, that given I've never really bothered to understand patient prosthesis mismatch, I can carry on in that uh, state of blissful ignorance. Uh, I think we should probably move on, don't you? Um, Thank you very much. Uh, well done, Roberto. Thank you. Uh, and the next talk is to be given by Michelle Lee. Is that correct? Long-term outcomes of trifecta pericardial valve for aortic valve replacement. Michelle, are you there? Hello? Yes, video paused by presenter. Here we go. I'm going to switch my microphone off, I suppose. Hello, my, my name is Michelle Lee from St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. The title of the presentation I would like to share today is Long-Term Outcomes of the Trifecta Pericardial Valve for Aortic Valve Replacement. So the objectives. We would like to investigate the long-term outcomes of patients undergoing surgical aortic valve replacement with the first-generation trifecta pericardial valve. Surgical aortic valve replacement remains gold standard treatment for patients with aortic valve disease. Multiple designs of bioprothetic AOT valves are available, and especially trifecta valve with externally mounted leaflets provide excellent hemodynamics. However, there have been recent concerns regarding early structural valve deterioration. We've prospectively collected our data for all patients undergoing AVR with first generation trifecta valve at a single institution between February 2010 and November 2016. We had 100% follow-up for the mortality and maximum duration of follow-up was 10 years. We've also produced survival curves using SPSS version 25. Results. We had 383 patients with trifecta pericardial valve AVR and mean age was 72 and 57% were male. In regard to aortic valve pathology, 59% has stenosis, 15% with regurgitation, and 26% has had mixed aortic valve pathologies. And 81% were electively performed. So actual all-cause mortality was 2.9% at 30 days and 8.4% at one year and 16.2% at three years. The Kaplan My estimate of survival out of 10 years follow up is shown in this figure and it shows good long term mortality. Out of 383 patients, we had total 15 reoperations in 11 patients. One early reoperation at three months for aortic regurgitation and 14 late reoperations, giving a total 10 year reoperation rate of 2.6%. So of these patients, five were for infective endocarditis, four for aortic regurgitation, three for restenosis, and two cases with paravalvular leak. So in conclusion, long-term results from first-generation trifecta valve show good long-term mortality with low levels of re-intervention for structural valve degeneration out of 10 years of follow-up. Thank you. Pankaj, do we have any questions accumulated from the audience? Uh, no, no, nothing. Other than other published series, especially for the first generation of well. ours. Good question, David. So, Michelle, what do you, how would you answer Mr. Jenkins on that subject? Sorry, do you mind um, repeating the question? Um, it ju I just had some buffering of the internet. Are these results similar to other series and generalizable to all, 
or specific to a single surgeon. They appear better than other published theories, especially for the first generation valve. Okay. Um, so um, for this abstract, the results we have is not um, just whether by the single surgeon. So it's difficult to say, but so I will say it's more similar to the generalized result. result. But because um, for this outcome, I can't, we can't say what exact factors are contributing. For example, it can relate it to the um, techniques of the surgeons, but we can also say this is because of the valve itself um, or the patients. Um, so so I, I, I think that this is more a uh, generalized sign. You had a number of early reoperations for aortic regurgitation that were apparently not paravalvular leak. And I didn't quite understand what the mechanism of aortic regurgitation was in these patients. Um, again, I'm not, I, I can't really explain for the me mechanism of the paravalvular leak after the trifecta. Uh, paravalvular leak. This was, a, this was a separate category from patients who were reoperated on for paravalvular leak. Presumably, therefore, this was transvalvular. Yes. And that's unusual early after surgery, unless there's been some technical misadventure. Um, sorry, I can't, I'm, I'm not too sure. It may be related to the surgeon's technique, or it may be related to the valve itself, or I think there are many factors which can contribute. Very good. There's an excellent question, Julian, from Betsy. It says, what was the timing of the reinterventions? I assume that most of the cases were not out to 10 years. And in fact, I'll add a supplementary question to that. Your mean follow-up was 5.2 years. How many patients were at risk at five years? And then it goes back to Betsy's question as well, in terms of what were the numbers at risk at five and 10 years, basically? So um, if you look at, if you look at back to the graph, um, I think that can explain a bit better about that. You can just give us a number, you know, Michelle. Uh, sorry, you, you, you can't struggle to go back to the graph. Um, sorry, I can't. I, I can't click the graph at the moment. Okay, how many patients roughly were out to ten years? Um, sorry, I, I can't access it. Okay, don't worry. I think I'll just caution you in interpreting those results. You know, in the sense, how many patients were at risk at five years and ten years when you produce a data which has two percent total reoperation rates? So that's all. Okay. I think in the interest of time, we should move on, Julian. I agree. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Really interesting presentation and well done. So we move on to the third presentation in this morning session. So this also comes from the Baths and Bartholomew's group. The presentation is titled Transcatheter aortic valve implantation to expedite non-cardiac surgery in patients with severe aortic stenosis. And the presentation is to be given by Tunde Olibanji. So is Tunde on the call? No. Do we have any presentations? Presenters. Ah, Tunde. Thank you for the opportunity to present our data on transcatheter aortic valve implantation to expedite non cardiac surgery in patients with severe aortic uh, stenosis. It is not uncommon to find patients with severe aortic stenosis that also have um, non cardiac surgical problems that require uh, surgery. Uh, TAB is not currently recommended for treatment of asymptomatic uh, severe aortic stenosis patients, and it's only recommended for treatment of symptomatic severe aortic stenosis patients if they are at high risk for uh, surgical aortic valve replacement. But uh, the scope of TAB has expanded beyond uh, the scope covered by the EACTS guidelines. However, there is limited data on the outcomes of patients with severe aortic stenosis referred for TAVI to facilitate non-cardiac surgery. Uh, we therefore decided to look at the outcomes in this category of patients. Specifically, we wanted to find out if complications are increased in these patients 
or start with delay non-cardiac surgery, how long the patients wait before non-cardiac surgery, and uh, wanted to know if the NYHA class I mean, had any effect on the outcomes in this category of patients. Um, it was a retrospective study, which we did over five years. We used the standard definitions of severe aortic uh, stenosis, and we compared both symptomatic and uh, asymptomatic patients. Uh, our primary outcome measure was all-cause mortality. Secondary outcome measures were stroke, permanent pacemaker implantation, acute kidney injury, length of hospital stay, and at least moderate paravascular regurgitation. Uh, survival statistics was calculated using a Kaplan-Meier analysis, and we use a standard statistical test for categorical and continuous variables. P-value of less than 0.05 was considered significant. Um, 1,866 patients underwent target during this uh, five-year period. Uh, only 99 of these patients um, had target to facilitate non-cardiac surgery, and 63% uh, were symptomatic and 36% were asymptomatic. The median interval between TAVI and uh, non-cardiac surgery was about six months. 35% of these patients were referred to facilitate uh, hip or knee replacements. 11% required surgery for colorectal cancer and 9% for bladder cancer. The rest had a variety of um, other non-cardiac surgical problems. At the mean follow-up of about 22 months, only 31% of these patients had had non-cardiac surgery after the ATAVI. 45% had, did not have um, non-cardiac surgery. Um, 17, because 17% of them died before they could have non-cardiac surgery. And 28% uh, were subsequently reviewed and uh, were not deemed fit enough to have further surgery. Uh, we could not retrieve data for about 23% of patients. We could not tell whether this year once had done on cardiac surgery or not. Well, we have all that we know that 10% of them had died at the time of uh, this review. And the main duration between TAVI and death was about nine months. Uh, the Euro scores were not different between the two categories of patients. Uh, all cause mortality was higher at one and five years in the symptomatic group, and this was statistically significant. Uh, main survival was better in the asymptomatic patients, and there was no more difference between the hospital stays. Um, stroke, acute kidney injuries, uh, paravalvular regurgitation, permanent pacemaker implantation rates were low in both categories of patients, but they seem to occur more in patients with, uh, that were symptomatic, but these were not statistically significant. Uh, in conclusion, less than one third of patients who are going to have it to facilitate non-cardiac surgery will have their non-cardiac surgery. Those who go on to have their non-cardiac surgery wait an average of six months, and um, procedures uh, associated with low mortality and complication rates. Survival is better in asymptomatic patients compared to symptomatic patients. Uh, there are uh, some limitations to our study in that the population size was small and we could not retrieve some data in about 23% of patients. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, can you hear now? Yeah. Should be. So interesting presentation and nice data to share. Uh, whilst the audience sort of types some questions, you know, I'm going to ask you a question. How is the decision making process, uh, you know, at parts, given the fact that 17% of your patients didn't make it to non-cardiac surgery and the delay was eight months? Do you think there's any role for other adjunct temporizing measures such as a balloon aortic valve loplasty, and does that fit into the decision-making tree? Um, can you hear me? Can you hear? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? I can. Yes. Hear. Yeah. Yes. Um, so we, we did the study based on the... Um, um, uh, we looked at the current guidelines of uh, EACTS and uh, 
the actual recommendations for uh, uh, in patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery were TAVI if the patient was uh, symptomatic and um, was high risk for uh, surgical aortic valve replacement. The recommendations in asymptomatic patients they do not really mention uh, TAVI or um, balloon aortic valvuloplasty in the recommendations. Um, the reason we can't, most of the reasons why, uh, most of them were it, um, orthopedic problems. I think maybe that was why there was a bit of delay in getting their non-cardiac surgery. There was no delay in getting their TAVI. Um, there was no delay in getting their TAVI. The duration between presentation and parts and getting their TAVI was uh, uh, about 24 or 48 hours. Uh, so there was really no delay. So can't say um, BAV um, will be necessary in in this patient. Um, okay, thank you. Any other questions? There's nothing on the chat boxes. Ah, here's an interesting question. I will. It's from Mr. Jenkins again. David is keeping busy. So I've never been convinced by enabling surgery even with aortic stenosis, especially in asymptomatic patient. Do you know, has there been ever a randomized control trial? Uh, there's, been no there's been no randomized control trials in um, asymptomatic patients. There have only been retrospective studies in patients that have had um, that have undergone non-cardiac surgery without having, uh, that have had severe aortic stenosis, had non-cardiac surgery, uh, but didn't have their aortic valve replaced before the non-cardiac surgery. And uh, in the retrospective studies, mortality in those patients were about five, uh, depending on the study, it was about five, between five and 10%. Uh, mortality in this series was uh, lower if they uh, had their aortic valve replaced, uh, had a procedure on the aortic valves before undergoing non-cardiac surgery. I share Mr. Jenkins's skepticism about so-called enabling surgery. I think it's more often than not an, a maneuver to try and slim down people's waiting lists. And given the length of time they wait, having had whatever the enabling procedure is more than enough time to get over a TAVI. In fact, it's time to have a second early reoperation for uh, for an AOR for, 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 from the previous presentation. I think we should just do what is indicated on the basis of the aortic stenosis uh, uh, and um, as I said I share David's skepticism about so-called enabling surgery. Um, There's one quick question Julian if you don't mind I'll ask him this it might this is from Betsy now it might be an idea to assess the cost effectiveness of this approach to patient management and that's the last question to you before we move on. Um, yeah yeah it's a possibility it's just about getting the data we'll have to uh, collaborate with um, a lot of uh, gp practices and um, a lot of other hospitals because most of these patients are referrals from other uh, places so yeah it's something that can be done it's something we can look at and uh, we should be able to see the cost effects since we know that yeah, about uh, it takes about six months for them to most patients to get their uh, non-cardiac surgery so it's something we will be willing to look at. Wonderful. Thank you, Tunde. Thank yes. you, Morgan. Well Thank you. Yeah. So, Julian, over to you for the next presentation. So the next presentation entitled 19 millimeter aortic prosthesis. Does size really matter? Well, we all know the answer to that. Uh, Rashmi Birla, are you there? I hope you are. Rashmi. Hello, everyone. Today, through this study, we will Hello. consider the 19 millimeter aortic valve prosthesis. Does the size really matter? Patient prosthesis mismatch is defined as the effective orifice area indexed to patient's body surface area under 0.85 cm square per meter square. When this value is below 0.65 cm square per meter square, we call it a severe PPM. And it is this fear of PPM with 19 millimeter aortic valve prosthesis that scares us of all the cardiac surgeons around the world. We sought to interrogate, however, the real world outcomes following the implantation of these valves to see if this fear translates into more meaningful clinical, param clinical parameters. 
we performed a retrospective analysis of prospectively collected data between April 11 and November 19. All patients undergoing size 19 aortic valve replacements were included in this study in this single center. Demographics, operative details, and outcomes were analyzed, and we found that we had a cohort of 118 patients, of which 96% patients were females. Mean age was 72 years. Mean logistic euro score was 11.6. Mean clamp time was 78 minutes, and bypass time was 117 minutes. Concomitant uh, procedures were required in just under half the patients. Biological aortic valve replacements was performed in 86% of our patients. Of our cohort, the mean height was 154 centimeter, mean weight was 66 kilogram, and mean body surface area was 1.66 centimeter square. The chart on the right shows the etiology for which AVR was performed. It, was, it included aortic stenosis in about 80% of the patients, aortic regurgitation in 12% and mixed valve disease in about 8% of the patients. This is an example of the manufacturer provided chart which shows the effective orifice area for the given body surface area, which means it shows the indexed effective orifice area. This one can calculate preoperatively and project who may have a PPM for the given size of the valve. So if we use these charts for the patients uh, whose make of the valve was known, uh, we were able to calculate uh, or collect the data for 91 such patients. And we found that only two patients had index, index eff effective orifice area greater than the minimum estimated to prevent PPM. However, interestingly, at a mean follow-up of 5.14 years, only four of our patients developed shortness of breath attributed to PPM. So that's only 3.4% of our cohort developed any clinical symptoms attributed to PPM over a follow-up of five years. Of course, the single center study is limited by the fact that the echocardiographic data available during the follow-up period was not detailed enough to comment on the parameters such as LV mass regression, and therefore, study would limit its finding to clinical parameters at this stage. Looking at the literature, we have an interesting paper from Pibaro et al., which talks about um, how different the effective orifice areas can be for the given size of the valve, dependent upon the make of the valve. Um, and of course, it also compares the stented and, bi uh, and stentless bioprosthetic valves as well as the mechanical valve for the same size of the valve. Thus, the options available if PPM is projected preoperatively include implanting another type of prosthesis with a larger effective orifice area, example, mechanical prosthesis or a stentless bioprosthesis, enlarging the root to accommodate a larger prosthesis, or accepting PPM in the light of other clinical conditions. The considerations, of course, will include the consent process itself, for example, if you are now considering putting in a mechanical valve for somebody who's consented for tissue valve, there's going to be all sorts of consent process uh, issues. Availability of other types of prosthesis, for example, if you suddenly decide to put in a stentless bioprosthesis, it may not be available on shelf. Appropriateness of more complex intervention and the experience of the operating team in performing such more invasive procedures. And what is the goal of surgery that you're trying to achieve? Is there any other way of dealing with PPM which may or may not affect clinically, for example, possibility of weight reduction, perhaps? In our study, to conclude, we only had a small minority of patients who developed clinically significant symptoms of shortness of breath attributed to PPM. Therefore, whilst all attempts must be made to avoid PPM, the risk of a more invasive surgery will need to be weighed against its perceived benefit. Thank you. Okay, Julian, so that's the end of the video. Rashmi has put in the uh, chat box that she is struggling to get online. Uh, I see that. Um, yeah. Do you have any questions, Pankaj? Uh, well, there's one question here. It says, interesting project, Rashmi. Did you conduct an LV regression analysis or measure the VO2 max during your follow-up? 
literally just came in. Ah, yes, I see that from Dinja. Yeah. Dinja Akturk. Uh, the answer, I can, we can answer that for him, can't we? The answer is yeah. no. And I think that's a, a significant limitation of something which is um, rather, at this point, I would think rather subjective. And there's another question here which has just come in from Karen Rondome is, one of the problems with PPM is that measurements are taken at rest. Whilst this may be appropriate for elderly patients, the characteristics of patients do need to be taken into consideration. A very important point, Karen, actually, very important point. Uh, I think due to the IT issues that Rashmi has experienced, so she can't have an interactive session. What I suggest if uh, delegates would like to put anything, uh, Rashmi is here, let's see. Can you hear us, Rashmi? I can, I don't okay. like so, uh, Can you hear me? We can hear you, we don't see you, but that's fine. So I will put the question to you now, you know, that has come. Yeah. Um, with regards to a resting uh, status, you know, that came before. Yeah, um, I got two questions on the Q&A chat room. I was trying to type the answers there. Um, so in response to Dinsir, yes, unfortunately, um, the echocardiograms that were done during follow-up were not um, detailed enough uh, for sufficient number of patients uh, to comment on LV uh, regression. But that's absolutely what we would have wanted to do and might be a way forward, um, you know, taking this project forward. Uh, I'm not sure about VO2 max measurement. I uh, haven't, uh, I have to be honest, I have not, uh, you know, considered that before. Measuring PPM during exercise, um, uh, as Karen suggested, absolutely is, a, is, 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 a, is an interesting topic, uh, you know, and I think, I think that might be that it will then bring into life more PPMs than what we expect. Uh, however, what this study does show is that the clinical impact, as in what, what it does to the patient, what matters to the patient, and do they come back to you with shortness of breath, and are we having to replace a lot of valves because of that? Uh, and then we should, you know, if that is the case, we should take a step uh, away and think about it. And the answer to that probably is no at the moment based upon this study. Um, but more objective parameters like measuring PPM during exercise or measuring LV mass regression, absolutely, even for academic reasons, should be considered, um, you know, a resource permitting, I think. Okay, wonderful. So in the interests of time, I think we would need to move on now. So thank you very much. We enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Okay, well done. Uh, maybe you can take the comments on board for your uh, next project. So the next presentation is going to be, does obesity have an impact on the outcomes of isolated aortic valve replacement? And the speaker is going to be Olaniran Omodara. So is Olaniran here? Good morning, everyone. My name is Olanio Romadura, and I'll be presenting this paper. paper. Does obesity have an impact on the outcome of isolated body valve replacement on behalf of the other co-authors as listed here from the Nottingham University Hospital? As a way of introduction, obesity affects one in four adults and 16% of children in the United Kingdom. 60% of women and 67% of men are said to be overweight or obese according to the data from the Earth Survey of England in 2020. The prevalence of obesity has increased over time from 15% in 1993 to 27% in 2015 and more worrisome to about 40% in 2020. The picture by the side shows the different regions, different counties, and um, the, with the different um, prevalence based on the region affected. Over 37,000 children and over 400,000 adults are said to be overweight or obese in North Hampshire. The treatment of obese patients represents a challenge in our everyday practice across all the surgical specialties, let alone cardiothoracic surgery. 
There's a potential survival benefit, which has been described in the base patients undergoing cardiac surgery, known as the obesity paradox. The aim of this study was to investigate the role of obesity in isolated surgical elective valve replacement uh, procedures over a 24, 25 year period in our hospital, in the, at the Nottingham University Hospital. And uh, specifically, we wanted to know the impact of obesity in our surgical practice over time, and also the impact of obesity in post-operative outcomes. We did a retrospective analysis of 1,640 consecutive patients who underwent isolated surgical LT valve replacement from October 1995 and to October 2019. Uh, clinical and early outcome data of all patients were collected and re as recorded in the hospital computer database. We assessed the impact of obesity over the first period of 1995 to 2007 and over the second period of 2008 to 2019. Patients with B body mass index of over 30 were classified as obese, and those with body mass index of 40 and above were classified as uh, morbidly obese. This is a chart showing the different um, impact of obesity. So it is said that about uh, within the patient population that we looked at, over 40% or thereabouts were overweight and 19.6 uh, were percent were obese and uh, over 10% were morbidly obese. We noticed that the incidence of obesity increased significantly over time from 23.1% in 1995 to 33.3% in 2000, um, the second period. That's from 2008 to 2019. Looking at the preoperative data, we also found that uh, the obese patients as recorded were younger, but however, less healthy. Obese patients had a high incidence of COPD, diabetes mellitus, and also a significant smoking history, while the non-obese patients had higher um, scores, uh, Euroscore 1 scores of uh, 7 compared to about 6 in the obese patients. Uh, looking at the post-operative um, data, however, we noticed that there was no significant difference in in-hospital mortality. The post-operative outcomes and also length of stays observed between these um, two set of patients. The in-hospital mortality in obese patients was 0.8%, while in the non-obese patients, surprisingly, was 2%. There was a high incidence of respiration of bleeding also observed in the patients who were non-obese. Looking at the morbidly obese patient, we found out over 10.7%, as I've stated, which amounted uh, came to 176 patients were morbidly obese with a mean age of 65 years and a um, score of 6.04. 80% had surgery over within the first period of 1995 to 2017 and 2007, big pardon, and 82% had surgery over the period, the second period from 2008 to 2019, which means that uh, looking at the practice over time, Love, there have been a lot of improvement, which means a lot of obese patients and more so mobile obese patients were now having surgeries while uh, compared to the first half period. And we noticed that the significant factors in the post operative outcome, the in hospital mortality was about 1.7, which was less than uh, in the non obese patient, and stroke rate 1.7 as well, with a post operative length of stay about um, 10 days generally. In conclusion, we noticed that over 30% of patients who underwent, who underwent um, such isolated surgical elective valve replacement were obese. The prevalence of obese patients increased in contemporary practice in our hospital. And also in the selected population of patients who are selected for surgery, obesity was not associated with, associated with inferior post-operative outcomes. Thereafter, we concluded that obesity should not be considered a contraindication for surgical elective valve replacement. Thank you for the time. So, thank you very much, Ola Niran. Very interesting thank presentation. Yeah, um, whilst we wait for questions, can I just encourage the audience to provide their ratings and put some questions, you know, if you would like to ask some questions. I'm going to ask you a question to start off with. So, clearly, the numbers of patients or proportions of obese patients coming in for surgery has increased. That's a national feature. Yes. Whilst the numbers in that cohort are small, were you able to even give us, uh, get a feeling for 
any differences in the outcome for obese versus morbidly obese. So BMI 30 plus versus BMI 40 plus. Numbers are small, I accept that. Yes, yeah, so we, well, thank you for the question. Uh, so we noticed that we couldn't really uh, conclude or make any inferences from the number we had at that time. The intention was to include it, so um, to increase the number and to see if there will be any appreciable difference. But as of now, I'm not able to, I can't tell you because we didn't do it at that time. So we were thinking over time, if you increase the number and look at the in subsequent years, we'll be able to come out with something uh, significant. So, but we couldn't really um, conclude based on the number we had at the time of submission for this presentation. Thank you. Julian, any questions from you whilst I... No, I guess we should try and um, keep to time as much as possible. We're already running a bit late. So thank you. Well done. It's a good, very good presentation. Uh, let us move on in that case to... Thank you very much. The Enjoy it. Thank you. Emergency valve in valve trans catheter aortic valve implantation for endocarditis. Uh, and that's coming from Dr. Amir Fati. Uh, is Dr. Amir Fati there? Video paused by presenter. It looks as though. Uh... Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Amir Fati, uh, and today I will be presenting a case uh, for, of a patient who underwent emergency with TABI for endocarditis. To give you a, a bit of a background, this is a 72 year old gentleman. Uh, that was transferred to the IC department at Royal Papworth Hospital with a high lactate uh, state, low cardiac output, uh, peripherally shut down, and, and urea. And he has a history of general analyzer anxiety disorder, recurrent leg cellulitis, CKD3, and known biventricular failure, NYHA class 2. And he was also recently diagnosed with colorectal adenocarcinoma, for which he had an anterior, high anterior resection. Um, just a bit of a background. So in 2015, he was diagnosed with endocarditis, infective endocarditis, with streptococcus luteciensis being the infected organism. He was treated with IV antibiotics at the time, but unfortunately, he developed TOT valve insufficiency later that year and subsequently underwent a tissue AVR, and it was confirmed vegetation on the valve during surgery. In 2018, he presented locally with uh, symptoms of endocarditis, with fever, feeling generally unwell, was found to have streptococcus sanguinis uh, tissue AVR endocarditis uh, with positive blood culture. Um, however, a TOE found no evidence of any vegetation. Uh, he was treated with six weeks of antibiotics and had negative blood cultures post-treatment. Most recently, uh, to his present, uh, three weeks prior to his presentation, he was lo admitted locally with worsening uh, symptoms of heart failure, uh, fatigue, breathlessness, and uh, orthopnea. Uh, during his admission, he was found to have bilateral pulmonary edema and pleural effusions on x-ray. He was started on IV fruzumab for suspected decompensated heart failure, and he was also started on antib antibiotics for suspected cap. He had aspiration of his pleural effusions, which were sent for culture and were subsequently found to be negative. He had serial blood cultures for endocarditis, which were negative. However, TTE found that he had biventricular uh, dilatation, severe systolic impairment with severe aortic regurgitation and possible vegetation on the bioprosthetic valve. He had a CTPA, which excluded PA at the time. Despite the conservative management, uh, he required a uh, transfer to ICU with an urea, so he was started on hemofiltration, and he also required vasopressor therapy for his hypertension. It was discussed with uh, Papworth, and it was, uh, it was thought that the uh, cardiogenic shock was secondary to uh, biprosthetic degeneration. It was transferred to us for redo, urgent redo APR. On arrival, he had decline in neurology, drop in his GCS, he had a low cardiac output state with deranged liver function. He, had, uh, he was aneuric with this uh, creatinine 270, and he was also peripherally shut down. His observations, however, remained stable, as you can see on the right-hand side, and his blood pressure was 100 over 60 on base pressure therapy. His investigations found a uh, transthoracic echo, found the adhesions of the aortic valve with a transvalvular leak and erosions, but no vegetations were found. 
a CT head, coronary, abdomen, pelvis had no abnormality, and zero blood cultures, including the 16 SPCR, were all found to be negative. He was continued on uh, antibiotics and added fluconazole. He remained on vasopressor therapies, uh, and he was also remained uh, on hemofiltration whilst he was waiting for his read away VR. Despite this, two days post-transfer, he had a rapid deterioration in his condition over two hours, showing signs of multiple organ failure and GCS dropping from uh, 15 to 12. His microbiology uh, review found there was no evidence of infection and uh, all blood cultures were negative. At this point, I would ask the audience what option they would choose, uh, uh, what course of action. Uh, but moving forward, the cardiology and surgical team combined found the patient was deemed unfit for surgery, and uh, the uh, best option here was a salvage of Vivtabi. So this was performed, an uh, emergency transfermal Vivtabi was performed, a 23 millimeter sapient valve was deployed. Surprisingly, immediately uh, post-deployment, there was striking improvement in this condition. By the time he returned to ICU, he was uh, weaned off his vasopressors, and he was showing signs of measurable urine output. A post heavy TTE found the valve was well seated. There was no paravalvular or transvalvular leaks. We continued antibiotics for six weeks and it was discharged home. A one month follow up, the patient remained well, walking up to a mile a day, uh, improvement in his symptoms, and we considered returning to work. 18 months follow up found patient remained uh, well. Echo was normal uh, with no um, abnormalities in the valve and also no evidence of reinfection. So there was no plans for surgery at this point. At this point, I just want to discuss the pros and cons. On the left-hand side, the disadvantages of this approach are that there was a risk of latent infection. Surgery is the recommended choice uh, of uh, treatment in patients with endocarditis, and there is a uh, high in hospital mortality for TAV patients that has been reported in the literature. On the right-hand side, however, you can see that this was a life-saving uh, procedure for a patient who is an extremist. There were no evidence of infection or endocarditis. And this procedure not only could have acted as a bridge to surgery, but in, in this case, proved to be a definitive treatment uh, as far as uh, we've seen. And also given that he had previous AVR, the prosthetic ring would help in the uh, sitting and the deployment of the valve and uh, which would be less challenging than a first-time TAVI. In conclusion, under such circumstances, TAVI would prove to be life-saving uh, for degenerative prosthetic valve disease. It could be a uh, alternative to reduce surgery in such patients. Uh, but one thing to consider is that could this have been a thrombotic endocarditis secondary to underlying bowel cancer? And this patient has something to, to think about, okay. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Uh, happy to take any uh, questions. questions now. There are no questions in the chat boxes. So I'd encourage you, if you've got any questions for Amir, to submit them through the usual chat boxes. Um, any comments from any of the other presenters or my co-chair, Julian, about this Sort of a salvage situation is how I see it. It appears good early results. Long term time will tell. Yeah, no, exactly. That's that is that is what it turned out to be as you know a salvage uh, procedure for this patient. Um, it's doing well so far, but as you said, we need to wait to see for longer term results. Uh, I think my views on the non-surgical treatment of prosthetic valve endocarditis are fairly uh, reasonably well known and um, I accept that you may have um, salvaged something that was seemed um, seemed hopeless at the time it was presented to you but there seem to have been other opportunities to off dealt with this man's uh, illness in a more conventional and perhaps more definitive way. Uh, so, so are you referring to this earlier kind of re redo AVR at an mm. earlier stage? Yeah. He's a young man. I forget how old he is, but he's gone back to work apparently. So presumably he's of, uh, he's a young guy. Um, so uh, he was actually there's an interesting comment put in here on the sidebar to say this is a slippery slope for Tavi for all. 
treat all aortic pathology with a tally. Is that the panacea we're heading towards slowly but surely? No, I don't think even the TAVI doctors are that stupid, actually. I think they're usually more inclined to protect their um, their results by uh, uh, selection, and I can't see them. Um, I can't see them heading in that direction. I don't see the questions, incidentally. Um, That's been put into the chat box, Julian, you know, ah, into the okay. moderator's okay. chat box by Luke Rogers, who's our next presenter of ours. Okay, well, look, I think we should probably move on. Don't yeah, we? agree. Is, I uh, agree. Thank you very much. I mean, really enjoyed the you. presentation. Thank you. Interesting approach. Thank you. Cheers. Okay, so shall I introduce the next one then, Julian? So we're on time. So next one is going to be treatment of aortic valve patient prosthesis mismatch in adults should further surgical intervention be undertaken the presenter is going to be nabil hussein so i see nabil with us so we'll have your video nabil and then we will put some questions to you thank you Patient prosthetic mismatch following aortic valve replacement is associated with morbidity and excess mortality. This is when the effective orifice area of the inserted prosthetic valve is too small in relation to body size, leading to persistent fixed left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Despite this association, redo AVR may be perceived as impossible or too high risk, even in young patients who have much to gain. We review our experience in this population. In patients with patient prosthetic mismatch, it is important to first determine where the level of the obstruction is. This can occur at the valve, supra or subvalvular levels and often is a combination of these. There are a number of surgical strategies that can be utilized in the setting of patient prosthetic mismatch. This includes replacement of the index prosthesis with a better size valve, replacement with a valve with a better hemodynamic profile, or root and left ventricular outflow tract enlargement and resection of the panis to facilitate the placement of a larger better prosthesis and often a combination of the above measures are used. Annular enlargement techniques consist of anterior and posterior approaches. The posterior approaches include the NICS, which involves extending the aortotomy through the mid portion of the non conry sinus to the aortic annulus. The Manugian technique is an alternative where the incision is continued across the aortic annulus and into the aortic mitral continuity. This can be continued further into the anterior mitral valve leaflet a patch is then used to reconstruct the defect. The conal raston is an anterior enlargement technique where the incision continues to the right of the, into the right coronary sinus to the left of the right coronary artery, which avoids the conduction tissue and continues into the right, right ventricle outflow tract as shown. In our study, we treated 18 patients who were predominantly females of young age. All patients had a prosthesis size of 21 millimeters or less. The median age of redo AVR was 34 years with an average time of eight and a half years from the index AVR. Most patients were symptomatic with five being highly symptomatic. The preoperative peak aortic valve gradient was 93 millimeters of mercury and five had more than two stenotomies previously. A patient tailored approach was adopted in these patients with all receiving preoperative cross-sectional imaging and transesophageal echocardiography. The most common finding intraoperatively was subvalvular panis, which required resection. 10 patients had a redo AVR with annular enlargement, allowing the placement of a larger prosthesis in all but one. Posterior enlargement techniques were used in all the patients, with one requiring a second run of bypass for an anterior enlargement. Three patients underwent a mechanical root replacement. Three received a non-stented root replacement with two undergoing the Ross operation and one a freestyle bioprosthesis. Two patients had aortic root and mitral valve replacements with one of these patients requiring a mitral annular enlargement to facilitate a larger prosthesis in both the aortic and mitral positions. The choice of the new prosthesis was guided by patient preference and the intraoperative findings. 15 patients received a stented prosthesis with a better hemodynamic profile with all but one upgrade in size, valve size increased by an average of two sizes. 13 patients had a mechanical prosthesis implanted with two receiving bioprosthetic valves. There was no 30 day or in hospital mortality. However, there was one death at six months following late prosthetic valve endocarditis who underwent successful redo surgery and was discharged but unfortunately died from anticoagulant-related intracerebral bleed. 
The median length of in-hospital stay was six days and median follow-up of 714 days. There are three re-explorations for bleeding, one permanent pacemaker insertion, one transient neurological deficit, and two re-operations for endocarditis. In all patients, the peak aortic valve gradients over the outflow tract significantly reduced following redo ABR with a median drop of 17 millimeters of mercury. This was maintained at latest follow-up at an average of two years. So in conclusion, patient prosthetic mismatch in young patients after aortic valve replacement results in long-term hemodynamic burden. A number of surgical techniques and valve substitutes are available for adequate relief of patient prosthetic mismatch. Using a planned patient tailored surgical approach, successful repair of patient prosthetic mismatch can be achieved and maintained at follow-up with acceptable outcomes and careful consideration should be given in preventing patient prosthetic mismatch at the time of index ABR. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful, Nabil. Thank you. So can I just encourage uh, the audience to put some questions in the chat boxes, uh, which we can put to Nabil. I will start with one question. What about the symptomatic, the echo data you provided? What about functional class symptoms? Unless I missed it, I didn't see any symptomatic data. There, there was on um, the table, um, five patients had a, a New York um, Heart Association cl uh, class three and above, so five of the patients, and 15 reported symptoms. So that was the majority of the patients. Okay. Julian, any questions for Nabil? You might be on mute, Julian. Nabil, a, a good presentation. Well done. Um, I've clearly spent my entire consultant career ignoring something um, that obviously a lot of people spend a lot of time worrying about. Uh, namely patient prosthesis mismatch. So it may be that we have a relatively low threshold for replacing the aortic root, uh, and perhaps we just don't see it. I'm puzzled, that's what I'm, what I'm saying. There's an interesting question which has come in. They're anonymous, so I can't tell you who the question is, it doesn't matter. One patient had the same size, 19 millimeter, despite a root enlargement. Or oh, that's how it came across in the presentation. Could you please explain why and what enlargement technique stroke prosthesis did you use in the same patient? So first of all, is the interpretation correct that it was the yeah, same? Yeah, there, there were in that cohort, there was one patient that uh, we couldn't increase the size. Uh, and I believe in that case, a posterior technique was used. However, it's important to note that um, in that particular patient, it was one of the older generation valves that was put in. Uh, Although the size increase wasn't there, the valve, valve that was implanted was a valve with a better hemodynamic profile, so the patient still benefited. Okay, there are a couple of other interesting questions which have come through. One is from Stephen Billing, who says, did many of these patients have first-time AVR before adulthood, so i.e. teenage years, still developing? No. So the, 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 the median age of the first AVR that the patients had was about 26 years of age, so the mid-20s. So one, there was one patient who had an AVR before that with a pulmonary homograph. Um, so the majority of these patients had it in the 20s. There were five patients who had additional stenotomies previously, and these were patients who um, had uh, open valvotomies, and there was a patient who had a coarctation repair as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll read actually the next question. So do you think for the wider UK then that there should be recommendation that all aortic valve surgery in younger patients and the definition of young is less than 30 should go through a adult congenital heart disease MDT type of an approach then in light of what you've just shared and you've got lots of congratulations for the surgical skills for the team by the way. Thank you for that. Um, I think that's the way we probably should should move things. Um, Yesterday, there was an interesting talk on the treatment of bicuspid aortic valves. And I think that the surgeons or the patients need as much choice as possible of the different techniques that could be utilized. And then prepping up the patients preoperatively, um, cross-sectional imaging will help dictate what would be done in the operating theater. But at the end of the day, the surgeon is going to really execute that plan when they see exactly what's going on. And if they have a bunch of tools and it's been well discussed beforehand, 
I think they can be more confident with the decision that they make. Great. Thank you very much, Nabil. Really nice, nice presentation and good data. Well done. Thank so, you. Julian, over to you for the next presentation then. So, the next presentation is so Nabil Luke Rogers, who I know has signed in already because uh, we saw him earlier. Transcatheter valve implantation for all the Vorsprung durch Technik approach. Luke, are you there? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, I would like to thank the chair, the SCTS, and the team of individuals behind the scenes that have finally made it possible to present their, this work at the first SCTS virtual conference. Transcatheter aortic valve implantation, TAVI for all, the Vorsprung Dirch technique approach. Presented is a single center experience of transcatheter aortic valve implantation, TAVI, or replacement, TAVAR, if you're from across the pond. I wanted to start with the take home message as I think it is critical to how aortic valve disease should and could be managed both now and in the future. It is imperative that cardiac surgeons are not only part of the heart valve MDT, but they see and meet all patients referred to TAVI in an outpatient clinic prior to this MDT. This ensures that patients are provided with all the necessary information about the treatment modalities. Now, some of you may think of the, the Blur song Park Life when you hear it's got nothing to do with your Vorsprung Dirge technique, you know, but more of you may associate it with a well-known car manufacturer. Either way, the expression Vorsprung Dirge technique roughly transla translates as a progress through technology, although I'm happy to be corrected by any German speakers online today. Regardless, this narrative fits nicely with the evolution of the prosthetic heart valve from the first INSQ shyly pericardial xenograft to the distinguished Star Edwards cage ball valve, and more recently the sutureless self expanding Percival bioprosthesis. TAVI is only recommended in the UK for those unfit for surgical aortic valve replacement. It is, however, increasingly used throughout the world in low and intermediate risk patient populations at notable expense, approximately £18,000 per procedure. Despite this, utilisation of TAVI has exploded. This has been tempered in the UK, but the number of cases performed each year continues to rise. In Germany, for example, as of 2019, over 100,000 TAVIs have been performed, and it is now more widely utilised than surgical aortic valve replacement. The question, therefore, is, is this the right approach? Should the UK be pursuing this path? Is it right for patients? The well-known car manufacturer I'm sure that the majority of you were thinking about earlier is indeed Audi, and they coined the phrase Vorsprung Dirch Technique in 1971 in reference to a car that was ahead of its time, NSURO 80 for any of you that may, re may remember. Can this be said of TAVI? Recent articles in the New England Journal of Medicine, notably Partner 3 and Evolute Low Risk Trial, concluded that TAVI was non-inferior to surgical aortic valve replacement and subsequently led Dr. Reardon to claim that TAVI is now the preferred treatment for aortic stenosis at the American College of Cardiology in March 2019. I will not dwell any further on these studies, but for those of you that have not already reviewed these papers, you should. Instead, I present a real-world, pragmatic 10-year experience of a surgeon-led TAVI programme in which all referrals were not only seen by a consultant cardiologist and a consultant cardiac surgeon, but even all the procedures were performed together, irrelevant of the preferred choice of access. This included all patients referred for TAVI, and therefore a particularly frail and elderly population, arguably at significant surgical risk. These were further category based on those that were unfit for any intervention and therefore managed medically, those suitable for surgical aortic valve replacement, and those suitable for TAVI. There was, all, there was also a further group where their aortic stenosis wasn't yet deemed sufficiently severe enough to warrant intervention at the time, and these remained on the waiting list. During this time, 1,845 patients were referred to TAVI in the southwest from referral hospitals all over Cornwall and Devon. Females accounted for 867 referrals, the median age was 83, and the median follow-up was 23 months. Following review of the TAVI MDT, led by three consultant surgeons and three consultant cardiologists, 581 patients were managed medically, 202 underwent surgical AVR, and 783 underwent TAVI. 
A further 155 are still on the waiting list today. The logistic euro score for the TAVI population was 9.21, and for the surgical aortic valve replacement, it was 8.71. Survival analysis demonstrates the survival difference between each patient group dependent on the treatment received. It's clear to see here the medical therapy with the blue line, TAVI in the yellow line, and surgical aortic valve replacement in the green line. Alongside the clear benefit of either intervention over medical therapy, even in this frail elderly population referred directly to TAVI and not surgical aortic valve implosion, this illustration demonstrates the exceptionally good outcomes in this population with the surgical approach. Furthermore, a tipping point around two years appears to mark the point in which the initial survival benefit of TAVI is outweighed by the survival benefit in the surgical aortic valve replacement. This table illustrates the median and mean survival time categorized by MDT decision. It's clear that intervention improves survival with the approximate survival of only 2.1 years after medical therapy. In addition, surgical aortic valve replacement appears to demonstrate a survival benefit over TAVI at 7.9 years v 6.2, although these are not significant and it is important to, to appreciate that they are not comparable groups. As we already know, intervention in severe aortic stenosis saves lives, whether by surgical aortic valve replacement or TAVI. This has been emphasized in this work. TAVI is a useful treatment modality in patients at prohibitory risk of surgical aortic valve replacement. Although this is not a comparative study, a survival benefit in favor of a surgical approach appears to develop two years after intervention. It is therefore imperative that high profile studies exploring the long-term durability of TAVI are critically appraised. Surgeons are an essential part of the decision-making process and should be and should see all patients referred for TAVI in an outpatient clinic. This collaboration with our cardiology colleagues through the heart valve team will ensure patients are appropriately informed and the decision-making ro process robust. The vorsprung dirch technique approach, or to lead over competition because of technology, is not necessarily an appropriate approach for all. Just because we can does not mean we should. Individuals with severe aortic stenosis need to be afforded the treatment modality that is most appropriate and acceptable to them. Surgeons are an essential in ensuring they are aware of the risks and benefits of a surgical approach, and it is imperative that we inform and empower their decision making. So I'd like to close with the final note that all TAVI referrals must be seen in the outpatient clinic appointment by a cardiac surgeon. Thank you for listening. Okay. Well done, Luke. I enjoyed your presentation, Luke. So in Plymouth, what is your sort of referral pathway for aortic stenosis? Do you have a sort of some guidelines for the referral? If I was working in Truro, you know, wherever one of your peripheral hospitals, what would Mr. Lloyd and your relative TAVI operators will say to the referrers and their sort of primary care? It happens via um, two approaches, um, and that's either through um, referral to the operating surgeons for aortic stenosis in, in the concept that they think they're appropriate for a surgical aortic valve replacement, or it's via um, the direct link to Mr. Lloyd, Mr. Asopa, and Mr. Darumpel Hay, um, who are the TAVI surgeons, and they will take those referrals themselves from the um, constituent parts in Cornwall and Devon. What happens from that point onwards is they, um, the, the, all of those patients will be seen in clinic. Um, often the, um, the previous um, patients sent directly for open surgery are seen by the, the, the cardiac surgeon that doesn't think they're appropriate. So that's, um, that sorts that problem out. And those that are referred directly for TAVI um, will be seen or asked for ha to have the preliminary investigations um, in their local um, hospitals prior to their discussion at the heart MDT or heart TAVI MDT. That includes the three TAVI consultant cardiac surgeons and the three uh, consultant cardiologists that perform the procedures. Um, alongside the information, including such as the CT TAVI and the angiograms that, and echoes that are already requested, um, the, uh, we, we 
we have a picture of the patients to, to give some demonstration of frailty, although that's something that can be improved. Um, and then they are discussed based on what they think their prognosis and life expectancy is and whether a surgical aortic valve is appropriate or a TAVI is more, a more appropriate. The interesting thing that's come out of this study is that all of these patients were actually referred directly to um, TAVI. So a lot of those referrals were coming from cardiologists that, that, that thought TAVI was the best um, treatment modality. And out of that referral, there was the, the 200 that went for a surgical AVR still had fantastic outcomes. Um, and that was in a, a relatively higher risk population. Now, it's they're not comparable groups. Right? We didn't do we didn't have um, sufficient data to be able to do any sort of propensity matching or, or pairing up. Um, so that's so we can't compare like for like. Um, but I still think it shows real world um, evidence that a surgical approach can be very safe and um, is sometimes the most appropriate approach. I'll ask you one quick question from uh, David Jenkins. Uh, he just asked, you know, what about the TAVI operator? Have you submitted this abstract to the thesis as well, you know, about uh, sort of sharing it with the cardiologist? What, what, how do you think we should share this data with them? And then it hasn't, it hasn't, yeah, it hasn't yet been submitted to BSIS, um, but I'm um, absolutely to take that forward. Um, it's the, the data is, is, is shared between the cardiac surgeons and the cardiologists, and that's something they're, um, they're already involved with. Um, I think it just sort of emphasizes an approach that I stole from Professor Bapta, which is that the, the aortic stenosis now needs to be down to sort of the lifetime management of aortic stenosis. We, we, TAVI is a good procedure and it's and it has a long term uh, and it is going to have long term implications. So that means we, rather than just thinking about the procedure that's right at that moment in time, we need to start thinking about what's going to be right for the, the for this patient's future. And that's probably based on their life expectancy and how many interventions they may require in the future. And the last comment from Betsy as a closing statement, 6.7% of your patients died on the waiting list. Were these on the transcatheter pathway or surgical pathway? There's always a mortality. This, is, this, is, this was just on the TAVI pathway. Um, um, and it is, yeah. Okay, great. Thank Before you very we, much. I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, 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 yeah, congratulations. Obviously, as surgeons, we're excited to see such things. I would encourage you to take some advice on how you can get what will inevitably be dismissed as something which fails to achieve statistical significance uh, and see how you can work on that and come up with a control that is that is credible because you and I, of course, have a substantial prejudice in wanting to believe your data. Uh, and at the moment, you haven't, you've shown uh, something which would, I'm sure, be dismissed as being not statistically significant. No, absolutely. Um, I think the easiest solution to that and probably the best solution for patients on that is to have practitioners that can do both. You, you, and you're good, therefore going to be encouraging cardiologists into your operating room to do an aortic root replacement with you, are you? That's, that, that, that's one option. There is an easier option. <laughs> <laughs> well, I get it. I get it. I get it. You need to move on because Thomas Modin is uh, having wrestled with um, uh, different time zones is with us and an honoured guest keynote lecture, uh, which we'll all be looking forward to. Um, so if Thomas is there, I know you're already well known to most of us and well known to this meeting. Um, so I think we should uh, move on. Thank you.
uh, I've been asked to give this uh, key lecture uh, with regard what are the surgical options when TAVI fail, fails based on uh, a review of uh, current registries. Next slide, please. So, uh, I mean, actually, uh, it's very important for the youngers uh, who are listening to us to know the following. Publications tell us what is reported. It's very important to be uh, alert about that and what is doable. Guidelines based on uh, publications interpretation, what we might do, but registries is a picture of really what's going on. And I know that in general, uh, our friends and colleagues from the cardiology specialty like to show the surgery as a, as a monster, as something very bloody, but this was long time ago. I, we all know that we made a lot of progress and the surgical surgery uh, uh, effectiveness and minimally invasiveness and adaptation was uh, constant over time. Next slide, please. Next. Okay, so uh, let's go to basics now. Uh, one of the first uh, registries uh, to report TAVI failures was this publication in Jack uh, from France 2 registry. At that time, we had only 4,000 4, patients that have been followed up for five years. And you can see that we have been reporting if in, in case of TAVI failure and mortality up, up to 61%. But again, remember at that time, patients were all contraindicated for surgery. And uh, what I, however, when we used to look about what was the link between mortality and the valve dysfunction itself, it has been reported only 2.5 to 13 persons. So there is there was a big difference between what we used to call at that time severe and when we put together moderate to severe. The problem is how we interpret the presence of a SVD. This is a big question that we have to look at and follow. Next slide, please. Then actually everything brings us to talk and discuss about the durability. The problem is the current data with TAVI that we have are in, mainly based on devices that disappeared completely from the market. The Edwards Sapien disappeared. The core valve not used anymore, disappeared. The, the Sapien XT is not used anymore. So we are argumenting that TAVI durability is very uh, long, but actually this, all these valves disappeared. What about the new valves? We just have to wait and see. Next slide, please. Partner 2A, of course, Partner 2A, the majority of patients that, you know, as you know, were, were, were using uh, Sapien XT. And even if we look at Sapien XT at that time, you see that the uh, percentage of incidents where patients have been reported to have an SVD, a deterioration of the structure of the valve, it was 0.58% with the Sapien XT. It was only 0.14% with the, with the surgical valves uh, that have been used. And if you look with this, the minority of patients when we did the propensity matched uh, uh, adjustment, uh, you could see that with the Sapien S3, it was 0.29. So it's still higher than the surgical valve, much lower than the Sapien XT. So again, there is a gray zone here from which, for, for, from which any interpretation that cannot go in the direction of the benefit of the patient should be very carefully observed and uh, uh, commented Next slide, please. This is the notion trial. It's very important. I mean, many reports, this and many publication, I mean, many presentations and a lot of uh, uh, cardiologists use it to say, oh, look, with the uh, TAVI, this is from core valve, of course, we have up to eight year follow-up, free from SVD. Look the number at uh, the number of patients who are uh, uh, after five years old, 75 and then 62, then 54, then 30. So how can we make any interpretation about a reliable durability only uh, by counting this, this number, small number of patients? Next slide, please. And if you look from the same Notion trial, which is published by a great friend of mine, uh, they there was a tendency to have much more failure from in the bioprosthesis surgical group, but actually, 
if you look into the details, many of these patients still used to have, for example, a valve that disappeared now, like a mitral flow. So again, we have not been using the same quality, I would say, of valve with the same backup uh, for in the TAVI arm versus the surgical arm. So there was, it was like comparing uh, apple and oranges. And this is something we don't want. Next slide, please. So the partner three trial, which is a fantastic study that showed the efficacy and safety of, of TAVR using Sapien X3, has showed the, 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 that surgery could be better in, to eliminate new left bundle branch block, mild PVR, and uh, reduced gradients. Surgery was equal to TAVR for new pacemaker, vascular complications, moderate to severe PVR, and coronary obstruction. But TAVR was better in, in case of acute the injury, you know it. I mean, this is obvious. This is not new. Severe bleeding, onset of AF, this is true, uh, and some other factors. But if you look at these factors, most of them were immediate factors. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, so uh, what I wanted to say is that with surge and the, the group where TAVR was high, better than surgery was only for acute outcomes. But does it mean that we should sacrifice tomorrow for the sake of the day. Does it mean that uh, the benefit is really worth it for the patients, especially that now we are debating on moving from intermediate to low risk and from low risk to younger patients where there is a lot of confusion in, in the, for the guidelines. So this is why uh, with a couple of friends, we conducted a, a registry. Actually, this is the biggest registry so far. And I encourage you uh, to, to participate to it. I will show you how at the end of the presentation. So we conducted the explant TAVR registry and actually we conducted the same one for cutting edge patients who have had, who still have a, a mitra clip. So uh, from between two, 2009 and 2020, we integrated in all uh, from surgical centers who accepted to participate balloon expandable and self-expanding expandable valves, but also mechanically expandable valves with like the Lotus, which is stopped now. Uh, uh, in 86% of the patient, uh, they have had aortic valve replacement and the others had aortic root. You can see that we had the median follow-up of 6.7 months and the survival was really lower than, than in the normal population. Uh, you could see that in this population of patients who have had expansion, they have had more mortality. They have had more stroke also in comparison to the surgical group alone or the TAVR uh, practice uh, alone. Uh, the majority of patients uh, were uh, either elective or urgent and uh, emergency was more or less delayed over time. Next slide, please. 42 centers. We included 269 patients from uh, uh, different countries, some in US and some in Europe. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what we have seen. In the majority of cases, we patients have had only aortic valve replacement, but in some patients we needed to achieve also an aortic valve replacement. So the patient come, comes uh, only for, uh, for aortic stenosis and he ends up with a need to aortic valve and aortic root replacement. And so usually it's a bantle operation. It's not only a replacement of the ascending aorta. Next slide, please. You could see here that uh, the impact on mortality was uh, uh, meaningful, either if you were doing aortic valve replacement alone, but even worse, if you have been doing aortic valve replacement and root replacement alone uh, also. So uh, either isolated or at, in addition to aortic root replacement, the impact on mortality was really significant, increasing this, the risk of the surgery at any time of the procedure. Next slide, please. So why we have been forced to explain the TAVR? This was invariably due to either endocarditis, it's, it exists, and I think it's underreported, for structural valve de degeneration, uh, for paravalval leak, so it's not very uh, a small amount of patients, and for patient prosthesis mismatch. And again, we are now by the expansion of the indication, we can imagine that the number of patients in each category of these will be increasing over time. Next slide, please. Why we couldn't do a TAVR in TAVR in those patients instead of sending them to surgery because some of them are at high risk. 
So you can see that the consistent number of patients had a paraviral leak. And if they have a part of a leak with certain valve, probably that the second TAVI will not treat the problem. Some others had unfavorable anatomy. So it could be mainly because of the bicuspid valve, for example. And if the anatomy was unfavorable in the beginning, why should it be better uh, if the TAVI fails? And of course, again, the patient prosthesis mismatch. So you see, we are accumulating factors. We know, we knew them for a long time as surgeons that this could be a major limitation for TAVR, but despite that, we have been treating these patients. Next slide, please. And again, the same thing. If you look at the Kaplan-Meyer curve of overall survival, you can see that in any case, the uh, uh, aortic valve intervention again uh, alone or associated with the aortic root replacement at any time of post-procedure was impacted by, with a higher mortality. So this is not an easy thing to operate on a TAVR when a TAVR has failed. Next slide, please. So uh, this is very sometimes difficult to understand, but it doesn't matter. What we need to understand that this forest plot of predictors of mortality in isolated uh, uh, AVR, you could see that at one month, but also at one year, the, the, there are too many factors that could lead to increase the number of patients and increase the, the, the mortality rate mainly because of frailty, uh, chron uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, kidney disease, and emergency. So uh, operating on patients in emergency is not a good thing. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we, in this slide, we have added to what I've mentioned before the following. We have integrated in this, uh, 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 in this registry also patients who have had a self expanding device, mechanically expanding, but also balloon expandable. And we have tried to stratify the time to surgery. So, uh, and you can see that the, the impact on mortality was high, consistent, and significant wherever the time of the operation was. It was if it was immediately elective or emergent, the mortality rate was still higher in patients who, who needed to be reoperated on after a tavern failure. The in-hospital mortality increased. The one-day mortality increased, but mainly at one year. So those patients who in whom we wanted to wait, they have had higher mortality. And this is a very important factor to, to understand why we need to uh, observe and, and cover uh, the, the practice of TAVR. Next slide, please. So uh, this was from our registry. There was a, also a recent publication from an American registry conducted by Michael Deeb and colleague, as you can see it here, extracted from data, extracted from TVT registry. And the conclusion was, and we will go into details. Uh, these data showed uh, that we have to be very careful about the selection of TAVR candidates and as TAVR practice is expanding. And we will need in the future much more uh, 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 to explain TAVR patients. Let's see why and how and how things go. Next slide, please. So you see that, uh, as they have been saying, that the number of cases are expanding. And in, in, indeed, if you look between 2011, for example, and 2018, the number of patients who needed to be expanded is increasing. And this is only from TVT registry. You can imagine that, that in some other if we put all the countries together, the number is going to increase. Next slide, please. Uh, so if you look at it, oh, these patients at the time of operation at explant higher STS uh, score, uh, the indications were more or less similar to what I have said, power valve leak, TAVR complications themselves, structural valve deterioration. 23% of the patients have had SVD. We don't have this number in, in, in surgery. More than 5% of the patients have endocarditis. And look, the in-hospital mortality was 11.8% at uh, in the hospital. And we're not talking about uh, explant patients at one, one month or one year. Next slide, please. So the reasons for exclusion from repeat AVA TAVR were a bit, the need for concomitant procedures. For example, in our, our uh, registry, I didn't uh, mention it, but some patients needed tricuspid valve uh, annuloplasty, for example, intraoperative conversion to open procedure during the case itself, difficulty in positioning the valve because of the first, first tavern, the coronary height, uh, the endocarditis itself, 
and because we wanted to, to get rid of the complication itself. Next slide, please. So you can see here that the STS score is not the same at the time of explant than when you do the TAVR. So it's not true to say, okay, we do a TAVR and if it fails, we send, we send the patient to surgery. No, because the risk is not the same anymore. And you can see it here. When we add some factors, the incremental factors we are adding to the procedure itself are making the surgery at much higher risk. So this is not to the benefit of the patient himself. So please observe this very carefully. And this is was significantly higher in in uh, uh, in uh, in uh, in both cases. Th uh, next slide, please. Of course, this had a direct impact in in terms of increasing the risk of renal failure and uh, ICU stay, and of course, it it led to increased length of stay. Although it's it was not significant here. Next slide, please. So this is another work also from uh, Brescia, Alexander, and team. And again, they, they looked at the surgical explantation of transcatheter aortic valve prosthesis in, in, in the Michigan state. And they, they have observed the same thing. 20% of operative mortality, 76% of the patients had more than one in-hospital complication, and more than 65% of the patients needed a concomitant procedure that has not been done at the time of TAVR itself. Next slide, please. This is another work also on reoperation after transcatheter TAVR uh, extracted from the STS surgeon's database. Next slide, please. And it shows clearly that median time to explant was 2.5 months. So it occurs very often, actually. The operative mortality was 17%. It's huge. It's really huge. And the indications were part of a leak. You see, it's less than what we have reported. This is because the practice is, uh, the experience is getting better. Structure of deterioration, more than 10%, so it's still very consistent. And we don't have this with surgery. Sizing, position issue, and also endocarditis. Next slide, please. And you see that it has a direct impact on, on mortality itself, whatever the time of surgery was. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, also another paper uh, published in, uh, in Jack uh, recently, incidents, characteristics, what predictors also, and outcomes of surgical explant. Next slide, please. And you see that they show exactly more or less what we have been reporting uh, with the uh, 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 median time to operation uh, that varies uh, between 30 days and six months. And of course, the percent of patients in whom uh, we are operating at six months is bigger. Of course, we, some patients leave the hospital, hospital with the uh, uh, unfavorable result, but we try to maintain them, maintain them with medical therapy. And but actually, uh, it fails at the end. And you see it that the impact on on uh, on the quality of life, but also on 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 mortality, is really very high. Uh, regardless the indication, if it was in the carditis or not, it doesn't matter. It's not because they had in the carditis that the uh, mortality was increased. All the factors that we have been citing before uh, were, were uh, predictors of uh, uh, increased mortality. And this is also a very important findings of this study, uh, giving the number of patients that they have been looking at, confirming that we, what we have found in the other pre-cited registers. Next time, next slide, please. As you can see it here, that mortality increase over time. At one month, it's less than 90 days. And at 90 days, it's less than uh, one year uh, mortality. Uh, that means that patients get sicker and worse over time. So if fa TAVI fails, better operate quickly than waiting uh, one year. Next slide, please. Okay. And here you can see it also that Clear, there is a clear and significant difference in terms of mortality in the TAVR population alone and when you had for the same population to operate on them and explant the valve itself, regardless what the, the time of surgery. So again, uh, a better selection, better indication for TAVR is very important. Next slide, please. So uh, I would say TAVI failure renders the surgical options very toxic. But of course, in that case, we have to look what are the other options. It's not my topic today, but next slide, please. I think we have to consider carefully uh, in some patients, especially with a lot of frailty, 
the indication of tavern and tavern. Next slide, please. However, tavern and tavern is not always easy. We have been reporting this before. You have anatomical challenges directly related to the valve itself. You have the coronary problems, you have the endocarditis, and you have the paravalve leak sometimes that makes these, these things very, very, very difficult. And if explanting one tab is difficult, explanting two tabbies may be even, even worse. Next slide, please. So uh, repeating transcatheter aortic valve replacement for transcatheter prosthesis dysfunction. Next slide, please. And this is my the only uh, slide on this topic because this is not what we wanted to talk about today. The incidence is not uh, negligible. Uh, for failed TAVR valve, it's 0.22%, and for failed TAVR procedure, it's 0.11%. And you see that the mortality at one month increase over time. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, we all admit that TAVI is a fantastic improvement and should be embraced. There is no doubt about it. However, I think that this should be done in the, conf in the environment of a hot team. Every patient is a different patient, and this is what I call a personalized medicine. So a cardiologist with his peer-to-peer uh, -peer cardiac surgeon has to discuss and choose what is the best option for the patient because patients come first. Next slide, please. So this is, this is really very important. I mean, uh, uh, it's very difficult, and there is nothing more difficult and dangerous or more doubtful than success itself. Uh, but we have to be careful about how we deal with this success and not to be very eager to go in any directions. Again, not forget that patience comes first. Next slide, please. And this is the last one. Uh, I would really encourage you because England was not presented in this TAVR uh, explant and cutting edge registry, uh, but we would love you really to, to, uh, to participate. So we are five leading this work. Uh, I spoke yesterday to, with Cha, and uh, we, you are all welcome to contact any of us. And I think if we put all our data together, this will have much more impact on, on the way we're going to move with TAVR indications in the future. Thank you very much. Thomas, Thomas that was a, a masterful exposure. Thank you. I um, have long thought that endocarditis after TAVI is underreported, uh, and I've always been very skeptical of the glib assurances of cardiologists who say, well, we can do a TAVI, it rules nothing out for the future, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I don't know if you, uh, we are over time, but are you willing to take any questions if there are any? I haven't even looked if there are. Uh, so there is a question from, uh David. Uh, David, yeah. yes. He says, you have had relatively good results with the TAVI explants in a very difficult patient group. Have you gone back to review the original TAVI decision in the surviving patients in retrospect who should have had an SAVI instead of a TAVI as the primary procedure? It's a very interesting question, actually, as to why the TAVI has failed as requiring to be explanted. What do you think, Tama? Yeah, I mean, th this is a very important question. It means this is exactly what I, what I, what we wanted to create by this registry is that we take this data and we go back to it and discuss with our cardiologist. And in the similar cases, we say, guys, look, if we let you do, and uh, we let you go into the tower direction, this is what could happen. And in the future, an easy surgery would become very difficult. So yes, indeed, this had a positive impact in reorienting some of the patients. But uh, again, the battle is going to be even harder in, in, young, in, in younger and lower risk patients, you know, because they're going to say, yeah, but this is uh, the same. These data are with the, extracted from uh, all the practice. High risk patients, probably it will be different with the younger and the lower risk patients. But we don't want to repeat this uh, thing. I mean, one of the examples we take in that case is that, for God's sake, Patients come for aortic stenosis. How could you justify that we need in some, some of them to do th in 13, more than 13% a, a replacement of the aortic root? This is not an easy surgery. We know this. You, I mean, we, we know how to do it. It's easy. But this is not the same, you know, as doing only an AVR. So I think 
you have to be very careful. But uh, it has a positive impact in the selection, of course. Very good. Very good. Um, well, I, for one, will be encouraging our... I shall take your email address away with me. And we'll be encouraging our cardiologists or everyone involved in TAVA to yeah. be contributing to your... Yeah, so we will send you back the CRF. And I think, I mean, even for the authorities, when we have this kind of data and we show them, we, no one knows them really. You know, even in, in France, we have been battling for the last uh, couple of weeks, for example, uh, avoiding extension, extension of TAVA indications outside surgical centers. And we showed them these results. Say, guys, be careful. And uh, any patient is worth being treated optimally. And optimally means give him the best option, nothing else. Absolutely. Absolutely. Are there any other questions, Pankaj? No, I don't see any more. I think we're so long. Um, Thomas, Sorry. congratulations again. Thank you, Julian. Battling with the technology and the time zones, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and you've supported this meeting um, very faithfully. So thank you again. Pankaj, do you. you want to wrap up? Or? Yeah. So I'd just like to thank all the presenters and specifically to you, Thomas, for sharing, you know, such an interesting and varied experience with us. Everybody's kept to their relatively allocated time slots, despite the little technological hiccup. Uh, we managed to finish by eating into the lunchtime a little bit. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Have a break, stretch your legs, have a <laughs> cup of tea, a sandwich, and we shall just see each other in the afternoon session. So well done, everyone. Very good. Thank yeah. you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Julian, for... Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Appreciate it. Bye, Pankaj. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.